Ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we're sitting in the middle of a minor miracle. Um, Michael mentioned the hard work that's gone into creating this center. But let's just for a second consider the context in which it's happening. Across this nation, the arts are being systematically marginalized and trivialized. No more than in the world of education, where we see arts subjects taken off the national curriculum, the education minister vocalizing her opinion that all children should avoid art subjects as much as possible. Dep departments of the humanities and the arts in universities cut back or indeed closed. And even now, most recently, the whole basis and principle of public service broadcasting being called into question. This is an astonishing achievement, this minor miracle, in the middle of that particular climate to have spent and raised and spent over seven million pounds on this building in that hostile environment, I would go so far to say, is extraordinary. My dad would say to you that the arts are umbilically linked to the world as a whole. They feed each other. Society feeds the arts, the arts feed society. I don't think it was any accident that when my uncle David when he was running BBC Two, commissioned a huge series about the history of Western art, called it Civilization. The arts have an extraordinary influence. They are part of what we like to think of as civilization, the civilized world, being civilized. They have a civilizing effect. They're not marginal, they're not trivial, they're absolutely essential. And that wonderful remark of Asa Briggs that actually, finally, it's possible that our feelings are even more important than our thoughts is a very memorable way of thinking about the arts and, in particular, my dad's own commitment to them. I think they have a very specific calling, the arts. They look after a side of the national health which we can't see. It's not physical, it's not material, it's invisible. Our emotional lives, our psychological lives, our spiritual lives, if you like. In my experience, if you spend any time at all with small children, either at home or in a school classroom, you can see how the urge to create is hardwired into our DNA. Small children cannot wait to perform for you. They'll do a dance, they'll do a jig, they'll play a piece of music, they'll run around, they'll draw a painting, they'll do a drawing. They love creating. Self-expression is uninhibited and delightful. And somewhere along the way, we run the risk of losing sight of that. And that's where education comes in. I've seen in theatres that I've run, particularly the last theatre I ran at the Almeida, the effect of working with kids uh, from the social groupings that Michael was talking about earlier and offering them the opportunity for self-expression. And the effect on them is absolutely astonishing. Their sense of identity, their sense of confidence, their sense of self-esteem, and perhaps the most important thing of all, the ability to communicate, sometimes to communicate with people who are very different from them. Dad had an even more particular view about education. His view of education goes right back to the origins of the word itself. A duco, to lead out. He believed in a form of education which was not about stuffing children full of facts and information, but about the realization of creative potential and individuality within someone, that you lead that out, you bring it out of the child or the young person. And having spent three years of my life in this university, I can tell you Sussex is absolutely brilliant at that. Dad spent the last six years of his life um, in a very difficult state. He 
suffered a stroke and fell down a flight of stairs, which left him deprived of the ability to read, to write, to walk, and to speak properly, which, for a man for whom getting up in the morning was about activity and communication, was ghastly. But I remember when Malala was addressing the United Nations about her insistence and her fight that every woman on this globe had a right, a human right to education. I took in my iPad and I played it to him. And uh, it was one of the last times I saw him really visibly moved by this girl's bravery and principle. As my uncle um, told you in the interview you just saw, it was one heck of a tussle um, between him and his academic father. Um, there was no trace, I have to tell you, of show business anywhere in our family. We were an academic family. Uh, my grandmother was um, patron, I think, of the local theater in Leicester, but that's about as far as it extended. Uh, and Grandpa was a self-taught man who won a scholarship to Cambridge, uh, then became a principal of a teacher's training college in Isleworth, um, and then became principal of Leicester University College and oversaw it become Leicester University. And my granny um, was the um, daughter of my grandfather's first employer, which I think is a rather cheeky form of courtship. But anyway, um, uh, he, he married his boss's young daughter. But academia, teaching, was central to their lives. So as David said, to be told that he doesn't want to go to university and complete his education was heresy. But equally, Grandpa realized very soon that Dad was unquestionably the most obstinate man in the world. Uh, and if he set his heart on something, there was no persuading him. Um, and indeed, Dad did get the Levy Hume Scholarship to RADA, and the rest is history. However, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to imagine some years later, some 46 years ago, his firstborn um, son coming to him and saying, Dad, I really don't think I want to go to university. I want to be an actor and go to RADA. It was like, you know, this ghastly action replay for him. And he was more persuasive than my grandfather. Uh, his argument was, you have nothing to lose, and you have everything to gain. Go to university, RADA won't go away, the acting profession won't go away, and you never know, you might change your mind. And lo and behold, that's what happened. I came here in 1969. Very quickly, Asa Briggs asked Dad to become the chairman of the first board of the then called Gardner Center for the Arts. And I sat on that board as the student representative, um, as I say, in, in, in the late 60s. I was in the first pr student production in this building, which was John Arden's Sergeant Musgrave's Dance, uh, with Sergeant Musgrave being played by the wonderful Jim Carter, of Downton Abbey fame, who has remained a great friend ever since, and the wonderful Nick Wooderson, who is here tonight. He then was very quickly, not Nick, my dad, uh, invited to become pro-chancellor of the university. And um, I don't know if you remember briefly the photograph in the very exotic costumes um, with my father standing up and Noel Coward sitting down. Well, the long-haired hippie in between of them was me um, in 1972. And then, in 1998, he was invited to become chancellor. And he spent 10 years in utter delight being the chancellor of this university. And I think um, the VC at the time would tell you that he had an influence over the way in which this university um, was run. So he finally went to university. This building, very obviously, is part of his legacy. But I can tell you right now, with absolute certainty, that were he here, he would not wish us to be nostalgic or mournful or sad. He would say, fellas and women, there is unfinished business here. There is work to be done. Don't sit on your laurels. And he would look to the future through the Attenborough Center. Just picking up on what Michael said, I think it's important to see this extraordinary building sitting right at the center 
of some crossroads with three major arteries coming in. Obviously, the community of the university itself, both student and faculty bodies. The professional arts practitioners and that community, and of course the community that surrounds this building and this campus, both in Brighton and in Hove and in Lewis and so on. There is a moment here to be grabbed. I was fortunate enough to be present amongst the committee that chose the new creative director for the Attenborough Centre. And I can tell you, I couldn't have been more delighted at her appointment. Dad, as Ben Kingsley once said, democratised every space he walked into. What Ben meant by that was that he had no interest in anybody's status. He treated everybody equally. And anybody you meet who met him would say that for the five minutes that he talked to them, they thought nobody else existed in the world and that he really talked to them and listened to them. I talked a bit about the climate in which the arts is being treated at the moment, which I think is quite hostile. There's something even more worrying, I think, happening in our world where we can see certain constituencies setting out to systematically smash art and a man have his head chopped off because he refused to reveal where priceless works of art were being hidden from the Islamic State. And they're little drops in the ocean, but the drops that a place like this can stand for in terms of the civilizing effect of the arts is priceless. And as we stand at the crossroads and see one pull back to the dark ages and another pull into the light, I think this art center has a golden opportunity waiting for it. And I'm extremely proud that it bears my father's name. Thank you very much.